I have the honor to um, intro and MC the today's Hypergraph Hour, and we have the other two horsemen of the founding team uh, today with us, uh, Benjamin Diggles, our CRO, and uh, Wyatt Meldman Flock as our CTO. And I'm very delighted for this Hypergraph Hour today because it's going to be a plethora of information and it's going to show really uh, much more much more of a deeper background of what Wyatt has been working on in the background. Uh, I know all of you or many of you have been waiting for, for much more meaty engineering content for Wyatt to, to really you know, uh, make his voice heard and, and to show the world what he has been developing. And you, know, you all have seen the, the tech come to life with the mainnet swap and we have a full roadmap of feature rollouts. And you know, all of you, uh, you can feel the excitement in the community and uh, what we've been building up uh, towards to in the last three years with Constellation and every single step along the way we've been executing and delivering. And this year is the year that's gonna make a difference. So Wyatt's gonna present his groundbreaking uh, new insights on generative economics. It's a paper that he has submitted for peer review that's gonna get published. He's gonna show you guys uh, some code and, and insights around liquidity pools and also around state channels, which is literally the trifecta of what makes DAG and Constellation really different uh, versus all the other blockchain solutions that are out there. Because mind you, the generative economic model is not just a copy paste from Bitcoin with like the halvenings and everything. It's a truly authentic new way of how economic utility works in a, de in a decentralized system that is not based purely on stake. So let that sink in because throughput is a determining factor in, in that generative economic model and why it has really been able to tie true economic utility to the DAG token and to our network. So this is nothing uh, short of amazing. That's, that's why he wants to talk and, and present what he's been working on because it's truly mind boggling um, to see. Benjamin's gonna dive deeper and, and interview Wired uh, around several of these things because uh, pure code and tech content can be difficult to digest at some times and, and we want to have a, basically an active discussion around that. Well, on my part, guys, I, I want to lead and, and then hand it over very quickly. So on the Lattice side, we have been making big strides. We have been building out our team around Lattice. Uh, we have a real true strike force around Lattice now. We have a whole roadmap of feature and functionality releases throughout the rest of the year. And uh, we are at Constellation always considering market dynamics and movements within the market where we are positioned. and. You all know that since uh, I have at least presented to many of you uh, our you know, strategic positioning within the market. And so since we're keeping all these things in mind, we, we don't think it's a good time right now to immediately launch product on the lattice side. So we, we have decided to postpone um, the launch pad into the end of July, um, specifically just to capture more market sentiment once and if we should hit uh, a, be a better upswing versus being in a, in a chop city accumulation range where people get frustrated rather uh, sooner than later. So Lattice Launchpad is going to be uh, postponed until the end of July. And in the same way, we are, we are having um, um, security audits happening on the cross chain or on the ERC20 swapping functionality on Lattice. So we have also decided to really play it safe, have all the audits come properly into place and then uh, launch the ERC20, the swapping feature on Lattice in August. So those two dates, uh, keep that in mind. Nothing on our roadmap has changed. We're just choosing to be very deliberate with our timing in stride with the market and having all the I's and T's crossed um, because there's new, new regulation coming out basically on the daily. If some of you have maybe seen it, the FATF regulation. So there will be new stuff coming and we really have to be buttoned up with everything we're doing. And um, 
yeah, that's that's where we're at. That said, guys, uh, and I can only stress that enough without actually uh, <laughs> leaning myself too far out of the window, but we do have very, very exciting news in the pipeline um, on three, at least three different fronts across all our businesses. Um, one of one of those news pieces will definitely make big waves in the entire crypto industry. The other ones are very unique to Constellation and what we're doing as well. I can't say uh, more than that, and I want to keep you on your ledge a little bit longer. Um, but um, without further ado, I want to hand over to Wyatt and let him uh, talk about um, the technology. Wyatt. Wow. I mean, Matthias, that was, well, one, thank you for the update. And two, that was the greatest intro of all time. I got to start bringing you around to parties. Um, yeah. <laughs> Great to be here, everybody. I hope you guys are doing all right. Um, I will uh, just off the bat, um, will not warn you, the opposite of warn you. I will let you know that uh, it's actually, today's talk is actually going to be um, short, very deep, um, and just sort of focused on almost vernacular as opposed to sort of like code-based um, demos and, and things like that. So um, the goal here is actually to sort of uh, accumulate a collection of different talks and things things that I've done um, in the last six or so months around generative economics to various different groups um, and, and sort of just touch on all of the, you know, just sort of the main takeaway of what actually happens. So it's only a few slides, but um, I'm going to sort of be, try to build a context here, um, which describes like what actually comes out of a generative economic model and what does that mean for everyday users in the crypto space. So I'm just gonna do a quick little screen share the goal here is actually to try and have some some good conversations. So, um, you know, just get creative with uh, you know what you, you know, what what comes to mind, um, what this evokes. I guess you could say. Um, so yeah. So the goal here is really to talk about um, cross chain liquidity and in that aspect of generative economics and what does that mean um, for us as users? Because that's pretty much going to be the main um, use case that I think uh, differentiates um, you know us from a lot of other projects out there. Um, and, and this is sort of the lens from which um, I think everybody's going to first get their grasp on you know, this economic model. So just to once, uh, once again, set the context here, what is a currency? Um, this is a transaction or some type of an exchange um, that basically glues together what we'd call an economy, but in actuality, this is like a community or some type of a society. Um, th this is a way in which we are able to share value um, in a way that's meaningful and to develop trust uh, and relationships in ways that are meaningful for us. So just keep that in mind um, after, you know, for when we get to the last slide. <clears throat> so I wanted to first off talk about um, what actually differentiates us from from the competition. So um, fundamentally, our what differentiates you know us and this sort of approach are a collection of data structures that um, promote different use cases that currently aren't available inside the crypto space. So um, you know what we currently are is a collection of everything that is, but also everything that potentially can be. So. Um, I guess the first thing to talk about is this main unit of a currency or like a transaction. Um, obviously, this is stock in, in pretty much every protocol. And so that is, you know, the core thing that I think we are familiar with even from before the crypto space um, with us just trying to interact in our day to day life. So one thing that generative economics introduces, which allows for mechanics um, that will be described further, is sort of the inverse equivalent of a transaction. You can think about this almost as like one over a transaction, if for whatever that might mean unit-wise. Um, and, and what this has been at least dubbed uh, in terms of vernacular is an emission. Um, there's a story behind that, but think about it almost as the inverse of a transaction. And so what this does is it actually creates a connection between liquidity pools um, sort of wrapping uh, different L1 protocols. Um, so let me just sort of de-jargon that for a second. So in emission is essentially a way in which we can um, create the intention to transact value between different ledgers. So it's almost like a two-sided transaction. Um, think of it like a yin versus a yang, where both sides um, you know, converge globally, or sorry, both um, uh, emissions have to be accepted 
in the global convergence for the full sort of link to occur. Um, and what this does is it sort of um, brings together the correct units and also the correct sort of epoch of time within the L0 um, kind of global, um, I guess you could say inner ledger um, of the L0 protocol. So um, this new concept, um, it, it, it's, it's interesting. I could ramble on about it, about it in terms of creating like inverses for understanding um, and sort of doing dimensionality reduction. But um, what was really interesting about it is that it allows us to create um, some type of a sort of a warping um, in a way that doesn't um, destroy information between certain dimensions um, or units that each ledger may have. Um, and so it's, it's rather elegant, but um, I, the reason why it's you know, just great to even talk about is that um, from the perspective of everybody who's on this call, as we launch this, there's going to be a new type of data structure that we can send and receive called an emission. Um, and, and what this does is it basically rebalances your personal accounts, different token allocations. Okay, so like think about this for a second. When we own DAG, um, what's going to occur in the future is that by owning DAG, you'll be able to seamlessly transact this sort of like MetaMask back and forth between any token, not just ETH or other ETH tokens, um, anyone that integrates the L0 or creates an L0 liquidity pool layer um, and thus connects to the wire ecosystem. So this emission um, is actually going to be your gate gateway to rebalance your portfolio. Um, and so what this does is that as we want to analyze what we've been, you know, invested in, what we've participated in on a community basis, what we may be mining for, all of these different ways we can be involved, um, emissions are your sort of portal, your way of managing your account and sort of like a portfolio that that account represents, um, almost like an index that you're constantly you know, choosing. Um, and so this is really um, kind of cool because what it does is it allows for individuals to in real time um, either prop up with their support or sort of say, hey, I, I think that maybe another project might be better and move value um, in real time without the need for some kind of a middleman exchange. Um, it's, it's really important to, for the final um, tidbit as to like what this really does. But um, I think that this is something we'll all become very familiar with in the future. And so I'd love to answer some questions if anybody has on what emissions will look like in the future. And so um, within that context, let's also talk about a little bit of a shift in terms of other uh, L1 protocols and the data structures used for finality. So the data structure used for finality in the vast majority of other um, you know, networks, including DAGs, is called a block. Um, we have adopted the same phrase for something called a snapshot, which is a um, sort of like a window within a graph of blocks um, such that we can say that this is a converged uh, ledger state. And so um, what's a little bit different about us is that in the creation of these snapshots, uh, which is sort of like a culmination of different blocks, um, we have the creation of a data structure known as an edge. And so an edge is really important. It, it's just as simple as it sounds like an edge in a graph, um, because, but it's also very important because it's how we're able to create cryptographic signatures that link data together. And so as, from the developer standpoint, um, one of the most important things um, one, one person will do, at least in terms of guaranteeing some type of end-to-end -end security using the protocol, is to engineer um, an edge out of their own you know, existing data types. So when we go through a you know, state channel um, you know, development process, what we're doing here is registering data that we want to, to ingest within some type of a pipeline. But when we actually want to modify consensus in order to add special validation criteria, in order to, um, you know, maybe perform some type of verifiable action, et cetera, et cetera, what we will actually do uh, and the developer will do is to create an edge that represents um, stateful actions and actually, you know, literally is a cryptographic um, hash. So these edges that form, um, as opposed to like other DAGs that exist out there, which an edge links together one or many blocks, um, you know, sort of within some kind of global topological ordering, what we can actually do is create, um, well, namely hyper edges, um, or some type of a surface that connects multiple different blocks across all different L0 protocols. So for instance, I could create an edge that incorporates a Bitcoin block, an ETH block, a DAG you know, a checkpoint block, as we call them, um, 
all within this structure. And the output is a easily serializable um, cryptographic hash, so um, signature hash. So yeah, um, that's just one thing that I think we're going to think about in the future as we are developing some type of a um, reactive um, you know, protocol. So like imagine if we want to develop a consensus protocol that's able to um, be sort of like a central administrator, well, decentral administrator, um, for some type of a system. What we would do is create edges that allow for that central administrator consensus consciousness um, in order to reason about concurrent events happening that it is sort of trying to become aware of. And so creating these sort of patchwork tiles, if you will, on the surface of a state um, is, is a great kind of example as to how this actually um, sort of pans out. And so I, I, that, that whole diatribe ended with that kind of visualization of we're trying to create a surface of state data where we're using tiles uh, that are hypergraph edges to create this surface. And so this surface at any given time um, is equivalent and represents fluctuations within our account balances. So things such as emissions moving up and down, the actual outcome of consensus will modify up and down certain you know, value of like your stake of like a certain token within an account. So this is sort of something we've talked about um, before about how reputation and performance is used to strengthen or weaken tokens. Um, this is another key point that is sort of another crux as well um, within the kind of like value prop. And so, um, yeah, I guess maybe I should take a pause. I don't know, did, did any of that, yeah. uh, was that a little unclear? No, that was awesome, buddy. I just wanted to point out a couple of things that the edge block is is exclusive to a directed basically graph architecture, correct? Um, yes, it is. But I'd also say that like the hyper edge, as we're called, as you know, we've called it with HTTP is exclusive to us. And what that does is it allows us to create DAGs out of existing L1 protocols. So it could mm. be ETH, it could be Bitcoin, it could be the other DAG, it could be somebody else. Um, it's, it's sort of an extension of just like the edge within the DAG, but to, you know, other different ledgers. Yeah, I think it's important just to touch, just touch on this. I like this, that we're focusing on vernacular, because when we think about proof of reputable observation, that's essentially forming consensus at the edge. And this kind of unpacks a little bit about the how that takes place. Is that an accurate statement? Um, absolutely. So the formation of these edges represents... Um, well, the physical and virtual um, arrangement of your different nodes and sort of what data they're processing and what you know physical reality they're trying to represent. So yes. I love it. I think that the big, the big takeaway from here is Constellation is we know it's the only network that can do this. So it's good to flex, buddy. Absolutely, yes. And I mean, I mean it's definitely a flex, but um, I also just wanted to sort of evoke the kind of um, imagery in our mind as to how these mechanics work. Um, I think that's there's actually a lot of connection here um, geometrically in these these processes. And so over time, it will become, um, you know, more like native to you, um, sort of seeing their relationship. So just think about like tiles when we're thinking about edges between L1s and with the emissions, think about, you know, kind of like a chiral graph or um, like chemical or something like that. That's, you know, inversely symmetric. Awesome stuff, baby. The power of the microservices approach, I think is, is awesome. So I say we keep going. Let's go to slide four. So you have a couple of things just to think about as well in terms of, so this is like the third pillar of this whole slide. Um, and this is the way in which we can create mechanics of certain tokens. Um, and, and what that means is basically we create uh, a token, let's say an application token within the hypergraph network by defining the mechanics of a liquidity pool. So the first two pillars we talked about in the last slide were focused on global network dynamics and how one just develops something that processes data um, with the security aspect. Um, this now gets into the value proposition. Oh, and also how users change their accounts. So I guess I was wrong, but this also talks about the how users change their accounts and how users select certain tokens for different value propositions. So there's basically a number of different ways in which we can create a value proposition for one of these tokens. Um, specifically, like going around one of these paths is up to the user and creating like, you know, something that actually works and is within, you know, the 
current legal frameworks of the day and yada yada. But um, you know, obviously these are just knobs one can turn to, you know, make a thing. So um, in general, you know, we have proof of work rewards, something as simple as, um, you know, just validating transactions. I've, you know, coined at this at also inside of the code base regenerative economics, um, just out of simplicity, um, since pretty much everybody's doing this. And, you know, everybody's doing some proof of usefulness, whether it's proof of, you know, hash rate work or, you know, reputable observation, whatever. Um, another is the ability to share um, fluctuations inside of the liquidity pool with any owner of some type of a token. So let's imagine that we create a project and somebody, um, you want to invest in this project. This, in this case, uh, by owning the certain token, the token may or may not fluctuate relative to other tokens, the sort of pairing value, sort of like what you'd see on an exchange, um, based upon some other factor. And so by that, um, just owning one of these tokens could increase or decrease um, in value. So as to, Whatever that may mean, that's just a possible mechanic that could be engineered. Another might be um, a native pairing. So something that kind of wraps two different tokens um, in some type of a composite uh, unit of value. And so this is really where we want to create something almost kind of like kind of like an ETF or kind of like something that's like an index of various different services. And so um, this is sort of on the more like fintech angle. But if someone were interested in, say, investing in mining focused um, tokens and mining, you know, operations that were tokenized, um, you know, those could potentially, you know, someone could spin up a um, hybrid node as we call it and integrate these different currencies that are being mined into the total value of that token. So these are ways in which we can engineer mechanics that represent what currently exists in the FinTech space, but also something more exotic and hopefully uh, better suited to a specific use case um, because the, these actual mechanics are programmatic um, and a lot, you know, as you can, you know, comparatively, like from a smart contract or something to creating a financial product, um, it's a lot different than, you know, doing it the, uh, the paper way. So um, that was just a little bit of a focus on what are these different tokens that we're going to see um, and sort of what are those mechanics going to look like. So I kind of just want to jump to the end because this, this really gets into a lot of product, you know, um, investigation stuff, and we can talk about this more. But um, I kind of consider this the third pillar as to how one creates um, their relationship with DAG and um, with the hypergraph protocol and hypergraph network and sort of what does a hypergraph network do for the crypto believer and user. And so the final result here is that all of these three different pillars create a global protocol that prevents scams. I mean, the TLDR here is that if somebody wants to actually take the risk and believe in themselves enough to integrate with the L0 protocol, they need to know that they have the right stuff to keep their nodes online to provide the services that they need to get done and to not try and do any fishy things um, on their token holders because every single project will hold every single other project accountable. Like this is kind of like the, you know, evocation of like, you know, lifting all ships um, by being connected through the L0 protocol by having this proof of reputable observation and the creation of these data structures and individual users to shift balances and trust and belief in different sectors of the economy that have different, you know, value propositions and use cases. We basically have a reformulation of free, you know, market economics, like directly from your wallet that, you know, allows to connect any certain consumer to actual producers of work and value um, in a way that the current, you know, centralized exchanges don't. Um, and if you read the paper, the reason why is because of arbitrage. So what this does, arbitrage is essentially um, understanding the system better than other players in the system. And so rather than op op operating within a, uh, rules of a game that are equivalent uh, and equal, which is sort of like, um, you know, a I guess you say tenant um, in free market economics that at least there is a marginal understanding of global information um, that is relatively equal. That is like the definition of no arbitrage. And that's what's everything is predicated in traditional free market economics is predicated on. Um, these, you know, our current systems are, you know, they're, it happens. 
<laughs> I mean, if anybody's worked with FinTech, we know what happens. It's just that it's the name of the game. So what this does is it actually creates a game with rules that prevent arbitrage and allow for a much more robust network in terms of actually providing use cases and services and things that make sense to people, but also by providing stability for individuals um, to invest and participate in projects um, that are showing real world value and that um, can be demystified from hype and other types of effects from centralization. Hey, Wyatt, I just want to I just want to sit here with this for just one second and add a little context. Um, you know, a lot of folks don't know we have a slogan. It doesn't really make its way out into our website and other things very often, but it is honest data for a connected future, which is something actually that Wyatt came up with. And this really paints that. I mean, if we were to have seen what Ethereum did in 2018 with all those ICOs, but had it been on HGTP, um, so much of that scam activity would have been uh, thwarted. And this is huge. This means that even us as founders and folks that are this close to the fire, we can't arbitrage this thing. This thing is foolproof. And that really is a, a game changer. I just know that if ICOs would have gone through this back in 2018, we would be looking at an entirely different ecosystem right now. And I think it would have made the jobs over at the regulators and SEC a lot easier. So I just want that to sink in that this is a whopper here, uh, buddy. Good job. Yeah, thank you. I um, And so, yeah, I just, I hope everyone is, is excited. I'm really excited to share this and to just, make it happen. So um, this is just the first step in that process. And I'm, I'm just been a pleasure being here. And I'm excited to share that with everybody. So and thank you for the context, Diggles. That was, well, spot on. Sweet. Let's keep going. Um, actually, that's that's um, the TLDR. That was just sort of okay. The yeah, speech. perfect. So uh, yeah, I'll start asking some questions. A little bit, yeah. Probably cool. the first question is, what is TLDR? For those that don't know, that means too long, didn't read. <laughs> it's, uh, it's something within the internet culture where if you got something long, it's just like, what What are the cliffs notes? And that's kind of dating back to the those from the 80s and 90s of just getting the high level. So this is like, if you're going to take away one thing, this is the big one here that uh, ideally I'd like to see us start getting out of trying to compare these really low level, um, hardcore skunk works uh, activities and really just focus on the configuration because it's, it's some a lot of this stuff is set it and forget it just based off the nature and the way that you architected it um there was one question that i got from the community or from the um the questions here i started the chat that i thought was pretty uh, apropos around the emission functionality and then i'll jump into some of these other canned questions but emission functionality is predicated on exchanges integrating it um exchanges where the individual owns tokens is that correct so explain a little bit about emission functionality and if that's pr predicated on, on exchanges and their participation. Yeah, so um, great news. So this has absolutely nothing to do with exchanges. This is actually meant to be something new that replaces the functionality of a centralized exchange. Um, every single L0 integration is going to be able to swap with everybody else and functionally exchanges will hopefully become extinct and will rely on a proof of reputable observation consensus to prevent things like front running order book sharing um you know minting bullshit you know tokens things like that dope awesome yeah okay so awesome um the question is of the three main benefits of constellation network is the fact that it does not have a single point of failure however if a state channel only has one node running would, wouldn't that node be a single point of failure? If so, how do we combat this? Oh yeah, I mean, well, totally. So look, I mean, I gotta tell you, man, I'm here to help you make your own sandwich. I can give you a lot of knobs to turn, but you gotta figure out the configuration that works best for you. Um, but I will say, uh, I wouldn't recommend anybody doing a single node state channel. Um, the th we just need three nodes in order to stay online in the case of you know civil attacks. So I'd say three plus anything, maybe four and anything on. It's literally just like a change in the line you'd use to deploy your notes. Um, yeah, yeah, so it's I mean, kind it's of yeah, change. it's kind of a broken yeah. question. It's like I want to create start a decentralized that. network with one node. <laughs> well, you're gonna have to decentralize it to start. So let's do that. Um, all right. Yeah. Is a state channel by L1? Uh, is a state channel a layer one by construction? Um, no. Yeah, I can answer. Yeah, that. Is that no. like it's like it could be an L0 as well. <clears throat> Oh, I would say it's it. I'd say it's both. State channel is both. Um, I guess you could technically make something on the L zero that doesn't require an L one consensus. I'm trying to think about that with like 
non-consensus producing nodes and then just register them as, yeah, technically you could do that. Um, so you only need the L0. You're right, Diggles. I think you only do need the L0. Um, I just would say that for everyone um, in our current model, you can just copy what we have for our L1 stock. Um, and it's just like, it gives you full like end-to-end, -end, you know, step level authentication. So. And so an NH state channel could define its own consensus mechanism, but it can also mm -hmm. choose to simple, simply inherit proof of reputable observation from the L0. Is that correct? Yeah. So proof of reputable observation um, is actually actually occurs on every L0. But I would say that um, every single person is able to engineer validation criteria that makes sense for them on their L1. So basically the L0 is still running a final validation step on the output of an L1 consensus protocol since it's sort of like that final filter that goes through. Um, but for a developer, um, what one developer would actually be doing is they would, well, the, for most cases, and it's really simple, you can just copy paste what we've got right now and just change it for your data structures. Um, just use our L1 and then we can add extra validation steps like if this less than this or whatever, you know, do a look up in a database or wait for something, blah, blah, blah. Um, you can put all of these different logical steps just inside of a partial function, just, just like super easy. So um, it, it's kind of just almost like scripting at that point. So uh, that's kind of where I'd want to insert that. And then the L0 is going to look up what you've defined on the L1 and just run that final validation step right at the end before it globally converges. Dope. Uh, I really like this next question because yeah. this grounds us into, I think, a lot of folks as those that either are new or have been following for a while, we're moving into a state of our accelerator program and really encouraging projects to not only build with us from a legacy perspective, but also launch net new cryptocurrencies. Um, and so the question is, if I were to mint a token, would it always have to be native to a certain state channel or could it live in the L0 and transaction wise be treated like DAG? And if that's confusing, maybe talk a little bit about how a native token works alongside within a uh, DAG within a state channel. Yeah, yeah, no, sorry, I just something happened with my headphones. Um, yeah, that, I actually touched that touched on that a second ago. Hypothetically speaking, you could register a state channel and not run an L1 consensus protocol. I mean, in my head right now, I'm thinking about that. That that's possible. I think that's possible. You just need to create like a wallet. Um, and then basically you just have to handle liquidity pool mechanics offline. So yeah, that's, it's a very simple way um, to make that happen. Sweet. All right. So the next one is a topic pertaining to Ethereum. MEV is a hot topic on Ethereum right now and grow, growing rapidly. Candidly, I don't know what MEV is. I'm, I haven't been following what's going on here. Or MEV, MEV, I don't know how it's said. Um, I know a DAG isn't prone to an MEV in a similar way since there's no transaction ordering on a per block basis, but could a subset of nodes collude to manipulate transactions ordering in order to extract value through arbitrage? What's an MEV? <laughs> no idea. Uh, minor right. extracted value. Miners uh, front running trades. Thanks, Duck. Miners front running trades. Um, that sounds like yeah, a limitation. So, I, I, don't, I don't. To me, it doesn't sound like worth looking into if it's something that's. But I mean, that's well, maybe something we could dig. Yeah, into. I mean, that's that's. So front running is a thing that can be prevented. Um, and there's some mechanisms in our case right now, like by limiting certain TPS to, well, one certain nodes by doing enough work, um, you know, for other folks. But how would I put this? So I guess I'm just, you know, if, I, if I'm if i understanding something incorrectly, I apologize, but I just would say off the top of my head, um, inside of the validation criteria for someone's L1 protocol, um, in order to prevent miners within someone's L1 from performing front running, one could actually create some type of an ordering um, or sort of an enforcement on who gets access to a certain throughput allotment and could essentially make that really hard, if not impossible. Um, specifically, I'd have to work out a solution to that, but I believe that's one use case. Um, and that's really, you would want that to occur on the L1. So like, imagine what we would do is like, well, for Lattice, for example, we would connect to Lattice. Um, so we'd connect Lattice to the Ethereum network and then, you know, provide, um, basically try to allow 
Well, it's actually a great, it's a great point. I don't know how could, we could fix it for Ethereum. It's almost like it would need to be fixed in the L1. Hmm. But yeah, All that's right, how you can see. do it. <laughs> Sorry. Great question. I really made me think there. Yeah. Uh, okay. Another thought, some clarity around proof of reputational observation would be great. What can you do to lower your pro score other than downtime or fragile, fraudulent transactions? Yeah. Um, so right now, fraudulent transactions will just get you banned, flash banned, and your tokens burn. So don't do that. It's really simple. Um, just don't, you know, just don't do it. <laughs> um, but uh, basically, we have a few different mechanics right now. Um, mainly, the number one here um, is timeouts. So um, basically, if your net node has really bad network connection and it starts dropping packages or can't like download and stream information back and forth. Um, we're going to know that it's going to time out and drop. And so what we do is we create an observation. And so all of these different observations, there's more, I'll tell you about more later, but um, are used in the reputation model in order to give a perspective of who's doing what in the network and who's doing something that is anomalous or like who's doing something that's different than others. And so in the case where let's say we've got like, I don't know, 10 nodes and nine of the nodes are able to send and receive packets within you know the correct time. Um, if one node is consistently dropping, then we'll notice over time that a lot of observations are created and we'll see inside of the reputation models output that the reputation score will drop. If it's really bad in this case, this is why it's a great uh, it's a great one to talk about. If it's really bad um, and we had issues with the creation of transactions per second metrics, then we'll even just like kick it off before the rep model um, goes on because we just assume it it died. Um, but that's the main biggest observation is network. Um, I guess you could say delay and also essentially network partition. Like, do we have a difference in the number of active nodes? Um, so that's that's one thing. Um, but also we have, um, yeah, I could actually just look at it, but there's just a bunch of these different observations. The most one is just, um, time dropouts. I don't have my code up. I'm still screen sharing, aren't I? Is that tessellation? Anyway, whatever. There's a ton of them. And basically I can do a bigger deep dive on the reputation model later. Um, yeah, I'm happy to do that. So in a couple months. All right, uh, next question. How are rewards split when introducing multiple state channels? I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause there. These questions are funny because <laughs> they're like three questions in one. So I'm gonna start with that one. How are rewards split when introducing multiple state channels? Right, so that actually gets down to the mechanics of what's defined inside of a token type. So if you look in our code base, actually, at how rewards are, you know, dispersed, you'll see essentially that it's being passed through, at least in RL1, something that's called um, eigentrust in order to, you know, understand, well, basically a slice of activity and then, you know, sort of weight rewards accordingly. But one could just change the actual rewards distribution um, into whatever they actually want. So you could create something that, let's say that there's 10 nodes and, you know, they mine 10 DAG, they could each give each other just like an equal share. They could give one node, all of it. They could really just define that themselves. Um, I could walk you through that, where that is in the code later. Sweet. All right. Um, are the current foundational nodes going to still be paid rewards under the same tokenomics as they currently are, or are their rewards changing with tokenomics 2.0? Um, oh, yeah. I mean, dude, everybody's nodes going to change with 2.0. So we are nearing the end of our node onboarding process. Uh, we've onboarded, um, well, or, you know, now with our last batch, I believe up to 100. Um, I need to double check the number. I think actually over, but regardless, um, we've got a huge onslaught of individuals who are hardened and weathered. And so uh, we're opening up the network imminently. That's like the next phase. And so, um, yeah, of course, everything's going to change. So this is something we need to really discuss as a, as a government, as a community, um, you know, specifically what do we want to decide upon? I can make suggestions um, and describe outcomes, but I think this is a community decision. Um, other than like the mechanics of these tokenomics, like specifically, do we give one DAG or 10 million DAG per snapshot? 
I mean, it's, it's, it's a good discussion. Awesome. Um, okay. Uh, this next one is on resources. Um, when state channels launch, how will projects be able to quantify the amount of nodes they will acquire to operate their businesses on Hypergraph? For example, does Lattice Exchange or Alchemy have any indication how many node operators they will need to run their respective platforms? I love this question. That's a great question. Um, so that really just gets into um, specifically what is the individual use case. So it, for you and your L1 and your that, the L1 is like your application. It's like your website. It's like the thing that does the thing that like you and your team, your company that your building wants to do. Um, and so that is totally up to you. You can have one node if you want technically. You could have 10,000, but um, really it's just a decision based upon like, well, what's it trying to do and what's the scale that you need? Great. Um, yeah, and as we, you know, as we get into this, something I'm very passionate about because here I am, you know, working with groups that are like, great, we want to launch a private, bright, private or permission network. Um, how many nodes do we need? And it's, you know, we start to talk about what their, their throughput uh, needs are, their requirements. But what always makes me happy about this is that um, there's no gotchas. It's just horizontally scalable. Hey, you need more? We just keep adding more resources. And uh, that really brings into uh, thinking about how we're going to configure it versus how we're going to, you know, scale this thing you know scale just becomes you know no offense but a commodity in a way it's just we just focus on how do we pump that thing to meet those use case needs um which is awesome makes makes my job a lot easier all right we got one more question here and uh i'm not sure if we have any in the in the chat that i missed maybe matthias if you see anything and then after i ask this question i'm gonna hand it back over to you mr math gold um how exactly will the next network be able to swap from other main chains, meaning how does the interoperability work where you can swap directly from, uh, for example, Ethereum to Bitcoin or DAG to, uh, to you know, Polkadot or a DOT? So I know you touched a little bit on this at the beginning, but maybe you can just touch on it again. Yeah, absolutely. So this actually um, ties into emissions, this new data structure that was created that's sort of like chirally symmetric um, to itself, but also it's like an inverse of a transaction. Anyway, um, the TLDR here is that basically when we create an integration on an existing L1, let's say it's Bitcoin or something, what we'd want to do is make a modification to like a Bitcoin core miner such that it is running an L0 DAG process. And now when we actually want to define um, that integration and sort of deploy the equivalent of like a smart contract to the L0 um, for that L1, say it's like Bitcoin, um, then what we do is we define the data structures and we also define the mechanics as to how the, the like network itself of Bitcoin, how those nodes um, converge and agree on how funds are transferred on behalf of the L0 consensus. So think of L0 consensus as being like a meta sort of consciousness, um, like an awareness of all these different protocols. And so in the L0 um, actual integration process, these L1 nodes will basically say, hey, we're going to do a 50% majority or this you know, strength of, I guess, a you know, Merkle root tree thing in order to converge. And so when that's actually present and available, um, then that validation criteria, which has been defined by the L1, um, is then finally processed again in global convergence. So what happens is in the L1, let's say it's for Bitcoin, they will like a Bitcoin developer will decide and people, folks will decide um, what are the criteria, the validation criteria for transacting between like one account balance on Bitcoin um, and potentially making a modification of another account balance within this sort of like liquidity pool. So let's say like transacting the Bitcoin, reducing someone's account, putting it into a liquidity pool, which is just a bunch of different random accounts managed by nodes, and then fluctuating a different token in reverse. Um, so essentially acting as like an order book, um, but in a decentralized way. Heck yeah. I actually scrapped up a couple of stragglers here that I didn't see, which I think are pretty, pretty cool. Pretty cool questions. Um, you know, one one of the ones is, uh, would you ever reduce the amount of DAG tokens needed to run a node? I don't know the answer to that one. <laughs> so that's great. Yeah. 
No, I mean, I absolutely, I, I'll be honest, like the specifically like, you know, decision as to like, you know, what we want to do for nodes and staking all the stuff or like just to, to run a node. Um, it's really fairly arbitrary from the protocol perspective. Um, this has just come out of discussions we've had with governance. So this is more of like a community kind of a question. Um, I'm supportive of what the community converges to ultimately, just by definition. I love that. Yeah. Um, I know we had some hash graph questions in there and that really is the kind of the big differentiator is our community focus. Of course, there's the technology, which we could slice and dice in a million ways, but we have a different ethos. Um, and I think that largely is something folks should not overlook. Um, I like this question too. How will updates be released to nodes? I, I do know the answer to this one, but I'm going to let you take this one, Wyatt. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Um, so node updates are going to be, well, I mean, it's really just up to node operators to pay attention. Um, I really have no intention to create some kind of a remote control, you know, key or something like that for updates. Um, so the current, like, uh, sorry, functionality is that if your nodes, and this is going to be the future functionality, that if your nodes version um, doesn't match up with others uh, and pass an authentication check, then it just can't join or gets kicked off. Um, in which case, like, you can send an alert or something just to re-download and, re, you know, resend it out. Um, you know, I mean, in terms of actually distributing the core code base, we can always check the checksums um, that can be hosted on various different websites. I mean, the most centralized thing about this entire project is just going to be that we probably host our code base on um, Maven and, and GitHub, obviously. Um, and so we'll have all of our releases on most of those, as well as probably different, various different Docker images of various, you know, different um, version heights as well. And so, yeah, we'll just keep uh, some kind of a record of what those are and folks can download and decide what version they want to use, whatever the use case is um, within whatever's uh, currently supported by the LCR. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, I, I keep asking questions because these are good ones. Uh, and I, I'm tickled great. Too because we're away, we're away from people being when moon and actually asking questions about the technology is where we should be focused. Uh, will there be a way for Solidity developers to copy and paste their code to easily create a state channel, i.e. will there be an EVM available? Um, There could be. It's possible. Um, I think that creating a collection of sort of connectors to smart contracts is probably the first we're going to take. Uh, I believe that LTX, if I were to surmise um, and sort of guess, it's going to take form in some in that sort of way, connecting to at least some, you know, various, you know, type of smart contract or scheme or whatever. Um, I would also say that just in general, um, the real final goal here of our state channels is to take um, the sort of, I created this thing like a specification language is, is what it's called um, for a programming language that is uh, like for distributed um, computing such that it's verifiable across different stacks and different nodes. It's called Babel and it's at the end of the first half of the main paper, Generative Economics. And so the goal here is to take that specification and to create a SQL-like syntax on top of that. So, you know, just something as simple as SQL and creating, you know, for creating like a streaming pipeline or a query or some type of a, you know, join that happens in between a pipeline. Um, basically, you can create a state channel on a REPL using SQL-like syntax. Um, and so in, in the future, I think that perhaps a transpiler between Babel and whatever that syntax and solidity is, um, it might be possible. There might be other ways to do it as well, but we will at the very least have a SQL-like syntax for distributed computing that um, is irrespective of a, you know, custom virtual machine. Awesome. First yeah, I love it. Machine. Cool. Uh, well, oh. lad, you're, you're off the hook, buddy, and off the chain. Uh, stupid pun. But I uh, last question is for me was, uh, why did Mr. Diggles take a celebratory shot? And as uh, Matthias shared, we're going to be rolling out this news. But I will paint a little bit of a picture here. For those that have seen Lord of the Rings, he's, uh, you got Frodo Baggins and Samwise Gamgee. You know, they're, they're taken off. And Sam says, you know, this is the furthest I've ever been from the Shire. That's where most of the projects fall. You know, they're all, don't get me wrong, I love all the efforts happening in the blockchain space. But Constellation is as as Wyatt had outlined at the beginning, um, we really wanted to create a foolproof 
a platform here for the long haul. And we're doing the same with our endeavors. We're not just trying to go after those that find us attractive and, and do cool stuff. So I, the, we have been on this journey. I've been on this journey where I finally got to Mordor and I went for the jugular in one of the things that I've been working on. And we're just so stoked to share it with you guys because it's, you know, I've been looking at our company like a mall, right? And this is like an anchor tenant, like a Macy's, but we still have the music store and the footwear store and all these great things, whether that's Stargazer or Lattice um, or state cha channels or, you know, so forth. So with me, it was just something very personal. And those that know me, I don't drink a lot. So uh, it was an expensive shot and it made everybody cringe because it was such expensive <laughs> liquor, but I didn't care. So I'm going to pan it over to you, uh, Matias, so you can take us home. And I just want to say how much of an honor it is to work with you, uh, Mr. Jorgensen and, and Wyatt. Um, it's been an awesome journey. Great. That's that's an amazing, amazing note uh, to have some closing remarks around. I mean, Mr. Diggles has been like Wyatt and Ben. Uh, we're all powerhouses and it's it's just amazing to see what can come to fruition and to life, especially after this journey uh, and through this journey that we've all been through. And uh, it just amazes me every day to to work with you all and and to be in a team like that but bringing her home guys man Wyatt this was uh, absolutely mind-blowing and I'm I'm really happy that you could go deeper into different transaction types so if people ask you you know or or ask us or anybody of you out there is like what makes constellation really special what is the technical nitty-gritty just to summarize on on a more overall level why it has developed a protocol that has uh, the capabilities of this different transaction types and those different transaction types like emissions like edges like snapshots they enable a vastly expanded functionality than what we're used to in in the blockchain space so if you ask about competitors well like that question before i mean you really need to do your research on your end all we are going to do is like Diggle said we are offering a solution and a vision and, and a roadmap towards what we have developed. And we're not in a in a pissing contest with anybody out there. It's more like, hey, come to the table, uh, join the L0 standard. If you are HBAR, if you are IOTA, if you're anybody else out there, it's not about who's better, faster, whatever, join the L0 standard. You develop um, a state channel that integrates with the L0 and we can all be happy friends with each other. So there will be use cases that are better for HBAR. There may be use cases that are better for, for IOTA. Ethereum has claimed uh, the DeFi space for now. Um, so everybody should do what's best for them. And that ties into what Diggles and Wyatt have been saying as well is state channels are businesses by themselves. So that question of how many resources do I dedicate to a state channel, that is your entrepreneurial di business decision. So that really gets us away from the idea of uh, uh, kind of like lazy blockchain entrepreneurship where you're just plugging in something into a smart contract. There's no, you're an entrepreneur and you're in charge of your resources and your business model. And in addition to that, you're not only in charge of your resources and your entrepreneurial your success that then ties into how your token moves through the entire token economy with the L0 standard. Even more so, uh, you better got to know what you plug into your consensus. And that ties into what Wyatt has been explaining with his almost scripting like functionalities. And that, like he always says, will make smart contracts basically obsolete because you can script your consensus criteria directly into your L L1 node cluster. So whatever you put in there is a verifiable the solid function within the consensus and once it's verified on your local cluster it will be verified on the l0 general network state so if you you know think about a, a sensor network you know you define everything between zero and 55 degrees Celsius and everything that falls without that range range of consensus, that sensor will be basically falling out of consensus of your vast array of tens of thousands of sensors and will report basically a failure of that little piece of machinery in your network. So you see how things can basically become almost self-aware through that consensus that Wyatt has been developing. So 
And with that, he, he's been covering reward types. So reward types uh, have implemented functionalities where you're not just having an ERC-20 that then needs to be emitted with smart contracts. No, the reward and business activity that you do with your state channel network, that is something that is coded into the token you emit. So rewards, emissions, dividends, profit shares, all these types of things are inherently programmed into your token versus having to stitch a, a smart contract on top of a basically neutral token. So, so you can see how entrepreneurship really shifts with our infrastructure. We're inviting everybody to the table. Everybody can excel. And um, that's what we're doing. We're inviting people to submit their proposals. Alchemy has been doing an outstanding job uh, with, uh, with their mission, with their community, with building a business uh, that will be launching on the Hypergraph um, end of this year. So with that, guys, uh, I'm super stoked. Uh, please stay tuned. We have a uh, massive news coming out in the next couple of weeks and months. And with that, um, have a good one and see you soon. Thanks, guys. Great job, guys. <clears throat>